Good afternoon, everyone. I think this is on. Yes, it is on. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Keo Kim. I'm the executive director of CTRL, and I want to welcome you to this afternoon's session. Uh, we have a number of panelists across from across the campus, and they will be talking about a very important issue, issue that uh, I think many of you have uh, been part of the accommodation process. And so uh, today we're going to get behind the curtain, so to speak, and see the uh, the the people who are involved in this process and some of the things we may not know about the accommodation process. And so uh, I, I'm going to hand it over to the panelists that will introduce themselves and begin our, our noontime conversation. So thank you and welcome. Hi, I'm Erica Gillespie, the Assistant Director of Disability Support in the Academic Support and Access Center. Thank you for being here. I'm really excited. Hi, everyone. I'm Anna Whiston. I'm one of the Disability Access Advisors in the ASAC. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Irvine Belson. I am the director of the MA in Special Education program in the School of Education, um, and also very happy to have you all here. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Chris Tudge from the Biology Department, and also director, current director of the AU Honors program. Hello, everybody. I'm Tanya Aho. Um, I'm a professorial lecturer in American Studies in the Critical Race, Gender, and Culture Studies Collaborative. All right, right. All right. So before we go into the agenda, um, very quick poll by a show of hands um, for the faculty members in the room. Who has received an accommodations letter either this semester or previous semesters? Okay, so most people. And I think we have our contingent of people who have distributed accommodations letter here, our coworkers, thank you for being here. Um, so for our agenda, we'll start with an overview of the ASAC, the Academic Support and Access Center, or ASAC, whatever you prefer. Um, that is the office that Eric and I work in. And we'll then talk about disability as a legal status and identity to provide some context. We'll then talk about accommodations. We'll provide a definition um, and talk about our process for determining them. Next, we'll get into some more specific accommodations-related questions, um, particularly with accommodations we tend to get a lot of questions about. Um, Sarah will give us a little bit of information about universal design for learning, which is closely related to this topic. And we'll hear some faculty perspectives from Sarah, Chris, and Tanya. And then we'll end with questions and discussion. Um, we do have quite a bit of information we're hoping to get through, so if you can jot down any questions you have for the end, that would be great. All right, so the Academic Support and Access Center. Um, we wanted to give some information about our structure because it is a bit unique. So when you receive an accommodations letter, it is from our office because our office does do the disability support for students on campus. Um, so this includes accommodations and resources for students with registered disabilities. This could be a full-time student or it could be a non-degree student taking just one course, either one. Um, we also help promote the importance of accessibility on campus. We always say accessibility is a campus-wide responsibility. We can't do it alone, but we certainly have a role in that. Um, but the other side of our office, um, we would call general academic support. So this is resources for all AU students, regardless of whether or not they have a registered disability. This would include things like academic coaching, so one-on-one -on -one support from a professional staff member on skills like time management, planning, organization. This is also where our more content-based support falls. Um, so the Writing Center, Supplemental Instruction, Math and Stats Lab. Again, these are resources available for all AU students through the ASAC. Um, in addition to those general resources, our office also has specialized support for student athletes. So the best place to start is with a definition of disability. So the American with Disabilities Act defines the term disability as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities, a record of such impairment, or being regarded as having such an impairment. So for our office and our um, accommodations considerations, we pretty much focus on part A of this def definition, a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. Um, so shout them out, what are some major life activities? School, work, work. Mobility. mobility, relationships. relationships. Good, those are definitely some good ones. Um, here is a non-exhaustive list of some major life activities. Um, some of them on there tend to surprise people when we give presentations like this, like eating, thinking, communicating, sleeping, um, you know, caring for oneself, learning. 
Um, so this is a non-exhaustive list, of course, um, but it definitely helps you um, conceptualize what a disability could impact. So categories of disabilities, this is also a non-exhaustive list, um, but there are a number of categories and diagnoses of um, disabling conditions, but it's important to note that a diagnosis alone does not always mean it's a disability. So a diagnosis does not equal a disabling condition always. Um, so physical, so we see all these disabilities in the ASAC. We have physical, something like a spinal cord injury, sensory, um, someone who is deaf or someone with a visual impairment, psychological, major depressive disorder, anxiety, cognitive, learning disabilities, ADHD, environmental, allergies, um, developmental, autism spectrum disorder, temporary disabilities, so if a student breaks their bone, um, bro breaks a bone in the middle of the semester, they tend to register with us. And then medical, like diabetes or Crohn's disease or other autoimmune conditions. Um, so people tend to know about sensory and sometimes learning disabilities, but really this is a um, comprehensive overview of different categories of disabilities. So how prevalent are these disabilities? Um, so in the United States, about one in five or 20% of Americans meets the ADA definition of having a disability. Um, and at AU, one in 13 students or 7.6% has registered with a disability um, with our center as of fall 2017. Um, now you may think, why is there this discrepancy between the United States average and the AU percentage? And that's because some students may not feel necess it's necessary to register with our office. Some students with disabilities may not um, need accommodations in college. And also some, since you do have to self-identify with our office, some students may not feel comfortable doing so. <coughs> Now, when you're walking around on campus, we definitely don't see one in 13 students with a disability, and that's because disabilities can be visible or invisible. Um, a visible disability is one's disability is apparent based on outward traits or equipment. So an, an individual using a wheelchair signals that they may have a disability. Versus invisible disabilities, so one's disability can, cannot be easily detected just by looking at them. So for example, a student's learning disability is not apparent um, by looks or external traits. Tanya? Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Um, so I'm doing this slide um, partly because my work is in disability studies, partly because I'm organizing a symposium for April 10th where we're going to be talking about disability and identity um, in the classroom especially and access um, in general. And so um, one of the suggestions I had that we could talk about and address today as well is how do we actually talk um, about students with disabilities or how do we self-identify if we're disabled. Um, and so one of the questions that we oftentimes get, and this is um, also on the handouts as well as on the screens, the handouts, the access copies are in the middle of your tables if you're interested in reading along. Um, so one of the different ways in which we can think about disability in contrast to what you just heard about, um, which oftentimes accommodations models tend to individualize the disability and in a sort of what we call a medical model way located in the individual. But oftentimes when we think about disability, it is actually an experience um, that can be socially created by the environment that we inhabit. So the disability that we might have, that we might identify with, such as using a wheelchair or being autistic, doesn't necessarily disable us. Um, it's the environment that is created for people who might not have that disability um, that might actually create the negative experience. And so one of the ways when you're thinking about your students that are coming to you is that they have these different levels, um, the experience that they have of living with a disability. Um, and then based on that experience, they might identify as disabled, but they might also choose not to, right? And so this will also influence the kind of language that they use when they come to talk to you, um, but also just how they process their experience as a disabled student at AU. So for some students, they have a very strong identification with their disability, a lot of deaf culture, for example, 
um, takes a very positive approach to this. There are both Crip and Mad Pride movements that you might not have heard about yet, um, but hopefully will um, in the future might want to also read up about yourselves if you don't know about them. Um, and there's also very strong anti-psychiatry movement um, that looks at the ways in which we experience mental states in a way that isn't just pathologizing an individual for those mental states. Um, and so we've recently had more conversations around what kind of language to use when we talk about people with disabilities. And there's, there's two different models, basically, what we call um, person-first models and identity-first models. And person-first models tend to be very popular um, in many academic settings and for many policy folks. Um, there's a strong preference to use person-first language, which means something like saying a person with a disability. And this comes out of a lot of real concern um, that wants to destigmatize um, disability and that wants to support people with disabilities. Um, but it tends to still ascribe to sort of medical model that individualizes that disability. And so a lot of disability advocates, um, people who self-identify as disabled, prefer identity first language. Um, so, you know, people would say, I'm an autistic person. Um, I'm disabled, I'm a disabled person. Um, and so there's two different ways of thinking about what kind of language to use. I'm not here to tell you which one is the right one. Um, and instead, I would just encourage you maybe to read and talk to um, a lot of folks who are disabled and to just see what they prefer. Um, when we're thinking about the actual moment of your student coming to disclose um, their accommodations and discuss them with you, you know, you can always just check in with a student and ask them, well, how do you prefer to talk about this? What kind of language do you use? And you can do that in everyday situations when you encounter people with disabilities, um, as you can with many other um, identity issues. You can just check in and ask them, right? Um, how would you like me to say this? How do you, would you like me to talk about this? Um, language that we shouldn't be using, that I will tell you, um, include words such as handicapped, wheelchair bound, or suffering from, right? Because they're all very negative ways of thinking about disabilities. Um, a lot of folks who are disabled also really don't like differently abled um, because in a way it obscures the reality of living with a disability. That is not something to be ashamed of, right? Uh, we don't have to minimize it as a difference. Disabilities are real, just like, gender identities are real and sexual orientations are real, you know, and so um, hiding that behind the word difference isn't something that every disabled person prefers. But again, that's something you might want to um, check in with people on. And if you have any questions, you know, we can do that at the end. Awesome. Thank you, Tanya. Okay, for the next part of the presentation, we will start talking about disability-related accommodations, and we'll start with the definition. So in this context, accommodations are modification, modifications or adjustments to the tasks, environment, or to the way things are usually done that enable individuals with disabilities, there's that language, um, to have an equal opportunity to participate in an academic program or job. So really the key there that we've bolded is equal opportunity. It's not about providing people with disabilities um, any sort of advantage or watering down an academic program or job. It truly is about removing a barrier to create that equal opportunity. Um, and accommodations are legally required under Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. And this prohibits discrimination against otherwise qualified individuals with disabilities in any program or activity receiving federal assistance. Like most universities in the US, AU does receive forms of federal assistance. Therefore, we are required to comply with Section 504. And how students register with our office and request accommodations is a three-step process. So first step is to complete the Student Accommodations Questionnaire, or SAQ. This is about 10 questions online. It provides an initial opportunity for students to provide their self-report as well as to state the accommodations that they are requesting. And at that same time, they submit clinical documentation regarding their disability. Um, so this, depending on the disability, is either from a licensed medical or mental health provider. And kind of like Erica mentioned earlier, we're looking for more than just a diagnosis. We're really looking for detailed information about the impact of that disability. 
And finally, the student meets with an ASAC disability access advisor like myself or Erica or coworkers. Um, and that meeting is really um, a two-way conversation in which the staff member and the student talk about accommodations, what's going to be necessary, what's going to be helpful. Um, oftentimes, accommodations are determined during that meeting. Other times, we need to gather some more information and get back to the student. Um, but when accommodations are determined, the student receives that accommodations letter, and it is their responsibility to get that to each of their professors. Okay, accommodations considerations. So these are points that our staff keeps in mind while we are um, working with students to determine appropriate accommodations. Um, first point, accommodations cannot un fundamentally alter the nature of the program or activity. I would say for faculty, this is probably the most relevant point and the point where sometimes we need some information from you. Um, so good example of this, I was working with a student in a communication class um, that involves learning several hands-on skills, one of them being HTML coding. So the student came to me and said, because of my disability, it's going to be really difficult for me to be able to actually write code like on a test. Um, so I'm asking for an accommodation to be able to write a paper about the history of coding rather than taking a test in which I write code. So we conferred with the professor um, and we determined with the professor that being able to actually write code was an essential part of the class. Um, so having writing a paper about the history would have been a fundamental alteration. Therefore, the accommodation was not approved. Um, accommodations must be reasonable. Another way of thinking about this would be they have to be feasible, doable, or realistic. Um, so let's say a student requested a sign language interpreter 10, 20 minutes before an event or a class. Like many institutions, we don't have interpreters on staff. We use freelancers. So making that request um, with such little time just wouldn't be reasonable or realistic. Accommodations must also be appropriate. So this means we're looking for a direct connection between the impact of the student's disability and what's being requested. If all the information we have about a student's disability points to that it really only impacts them for note taking in class, an accommodation for extended time on tests wouldn't be appropriate because it's not, it doesn't have that direct connection. And finally, accommodations are never retroactive. Um, so let's say a student takes an exam and because of their disability, they don't have time to finish it. A few weeks later, they come in, register with our office, and are approved for extended time on tests. They're not able to then go back and retake that exam from a few weeks ago with the extended time. The accommodation just works moving forward. And categories of accommodations. Um, so as faculty, the ones that will be most visible to you will be academic, uh, academic accommodations. These are the ones that will be on the letters you receive, like extended time on tests, laptops in class, um, accommodations for <coughs> attendance and deadlines, which we'll talk about later. Um, but we thought you might be interested to hear about some of the other accommodations available through our office. So housing accommodations is one category. An example here could be giving a student access to a single user restroom in their residence hall if that's necessary because of their disability. Um, dining accommodations, this could include having a student's meals prepared separately to avoid cross-contamination with allergens. And finally, physical access. Um, so let's say a student has a class in Hearst, which is not accessible because it only has stairs, no elevators. Um, if that student has a mobility impairment, we would move the class from Hearst to another building. Um, and sometimes this is for lifelong mobility impairments. Other times, like Erica said, student breaks their leg midway through a semester and the class needs to be moved. <coughs> And we are going to throw it to Sarah next um, to talk a little bit about UDL or universal design. Um, just to kind of give a little bit of a segue, the relationship between accommodations and UDL. As we said, accommodations are um, asking for a modification or adjustment. The idea of UDL is that we design programs, classes um, from the get-go to be accessible so that modifications aren't as necessary. Uh, thanks, Anna. Thank you very much for setting me up. Um, the, not that way. <laughs> um, <laughs> So we did a session, um, seems like a few weeks ago, but I think it was a few months ago, on universal design for learning. So I won't go into a lot of detail. You could probably watch that later. Um, but the idea of universal design for learning is, is in much as what Anna was talking about, trying to eliminate barriers to learning. Um, so we have to think about what is learning actually? What is it that that's, that st students in our classroom are doing? What is it that we're doing when we're in an environment where we're in, 
kind of developing a new set of knowledge or a new set of skills. And so that includes not only access to um, how information is represented, which is probably the most common way we think about accommodations. That is kind of making sure that, for example, the student who can't see is able to hear a recording or something like that. So representation is a big part of UDL. And, and Universal Design for Learning talks about how we can actually create these different representations of knowledge to actually help all learners develop a more deeper understanding of what that concept is. Um, the second area is in terms of action and expression. Um, and the idea here is thinking about how can we, um, again, get those barriers out of the way so that students can actually demonstrate a depth of their knowledge. So if they can't, um, because of some um, speech or um, speech impairment, they can't stand up and give a talk in front of a class, can they pre-record it ahead of time? And again, one of those advantages might be that instead of having to listen to a bunch of lectures in class, students could actually listen to pre-recorded sessions that might seem a little bit more professional than the goofy little class presentation. Anyway, that's the idea. The idea with both action and, re and, and expression and um, representation is, again, to remove barriers, but also, again, that idea that all learners could uh, ultimately benefit. The last area where UDL really likes to kind of push us is think about engagement. And the idea here is thinking about the emotive part of what it is that learning is. How do we make it more possible for more learners to feel like they actually can learn this information and it's really valuable to them? Sometimes students in our classes get the idea right away that if we have to make an accommodation for them, this field of study is not for them. Or if I need to change how I'm teaching for you, maybe you shouldn't go into this area of study. Um, or maybe you shouldn't be in my class. And that's a huge piece of UDL, is trying to make sure that students actually feel like they emotionally and you know, kind of at the deeper level need to be, or are willing and able to, and are welcome into our university classroom. So that's what UDL says on a big picture. And again, um, the UDL groups that have been around since the 80s um, have really been focusing on pushing this idea of thinking about universal design actually creates a broader and better set of learners, um, both as at yeah, at K-12 levels and at higher ed levels. There's actually a really wonderful um, website called UDL for Higher Ed, which talks a lot about both our kind of requirements to provide accommodations and make classrooms accessible and our campuses accessible, but also kind of going deeper into how we can push the types of teaching that we do in our classrooms. So that was a little bit of a grandstanding up on my platform talking about what we shall be doing in the classroom. But um, but that's what UDL is. And, and again, the idea there is thinking about how we remove those barriers. So very much along the lines in terms of what our accommodation should be. Is that enough? Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Um, so now we're going to jump into some frequently asked accommodations questions. So um, we're going to start with the testing process. Um, extended time on tests is a very popular accommodation for students. Um, so the process kind of is the student submits their request with our office. Um, they use an online booking system. And um, they must submit these requests at least seven days in advance of the in-class test. Um, if they miss that window um, and it's less than seven days before the test, we do have a late form process, but that is contingent on available space. Um, this is very clear to all of our students, um, even though they claim it's not <laughs> sometimes. No, just kidding. Um, so then immediately as the student submits their request, the professor receives an email. Um, this email is asking professors to submit um, pertinent information about the test, like what materials are allowed, like a calculator or a formula sheet, how long the test is for the class and the delivery location. Um, these pieces are really important because we don't want to let the student in the exam room with any materials they aren't uh, that aren't permitted by the professor. More so if the class is using something and we don't let the student in the exam room with it, that's not equal access. Um, the length, so if the professor is only giving a 30 minute quiz, we calculate extended time based off that 30 minutes, not based off the seven to five minute class period. Um, and then delivery location. We want to get the test to you when it's done so you guys can get on grading. So um, that's really important to have. While the professor is submitting that information, we are coordinating seats, proctors, extended time, test copies, um, test info, and how the test is going to be administered in the ASAC. 
Um, so then the student arrives on test day and except for a writing utensil and materials that the professor allows, such as a calculator, um, the student will store all the, their belongings outside the exam room. Um, the students are then proctored by an ASAC proctor for the entire time of their test. When the student finishes their test, they check out with the ASAC testing office. Tests are put into an envelope and sealed um, by an ASAC staff member. And then depending on the information that's provided by the professors, the exam is either held for pickup in the ASAC or delivered to the professor's location, office, mailbox, um, something like that. So uh, this is one hell of a process, and um, we're doing it for quite a few students, semester to semester. So for fall 2018, this past semester, we request um, we had 2,267 requests for exams, um, and we administered about 2,042. Um, in finals week alone this past semester, we had 787 tests requested and we administered 692. So that's just how many we administered in that, you know, five day finals window. Um, submitting these requests are 403 students last semester and 367 unique professors. So we're, we're constantly keeping the wheel moving in the office, you know, communicating with any number of students at a given time. Um, and then last, last year, last academic year, um, we had a total of 4,264 tests requested and administered about 308, wait, sorry, <laughs> 3,817. Um, so stu sometimes professors make tests um, take home, so that will have some melt. Students decide to take the test in class. Um, if it is only a 30 minute quiz, but the professor has time afterwards, they may finish it in their office hours um, or something like that. Um, so then the last semester we saw 506 unique students and 538 unique professors. Next accommodation we're going to talk about, which is another pretty common one, is um, allowing students to use their laptop in class for taking lecture notes. So some frequently asked questions we get about this one. Um, what if I have a policy in my syllabus that prohibits laptops in class? The accommodation does um, create an exception to this policy because students are legally entitled to their accommodations. We also get the question, how do I explain this? How do I explain that only students with their lap with um, the accommodation are allowed to use their laptop? Um, we would ask you to refrain from saying something like only students with accommodations or only students with a disability can use their laptop because some students would rather keep their disability confidential. Um, so an alternate suggestion could be something like only students who see me individually to make arrangements can use their laptop in class. Um, so you're kind of using veiled language to communicate to students. Yes, I know if you have an accommodation, you can use your laptop, but make sure to get me the letter and talk with me about it. And what if a student is using their laptop inappropriately? So if they seem to not be using it just to be taking notes as they should be, um, we would encourage you to treat it like any other situation of unacceptable classroom behavior. Just because the student is has the accommodation does not mean they can be using their laptop inappropriately. Um, you can also feel free to reach out to the student's disability access advisor. This would be the name that is on the accommodations letter you receive. Um, and from there, you know, we wouldn't take a punitive approach necessarily. We can't be taking accommodations away or anything like that, but we would rather see it as a developmental opportunity to work with the student on strategies for using their laptop more effectively. Use of a recording device for class lectures is another one we get a lot of questions and concerns on. Um, so similar to using a laptop for lecture notes, um, using a recorded a recording device creates an exception to the syllabus policy prohibiting recording in class. Um, students do sign a document with our office indicating their understanding that recordings are for their personal academic use only, not to be shared with other students, not to be um, posted online, um, etc. And then technology, we do have some technologies provided by our office, such as a LiveScribe pen and a system called Audio Notetaker. Um, these are given to students to kind of aid them in recording the class. So recording lectures um, has been around for a while, but, you know, people were finding that after the class, um, 
they would have to go sift through 75 minutes of information when maybe they only missed two or three points. Um, so these technologies are built in a way to break down the lecture recording so that students are easier to um, move through the lecture, only listening to parts that may, they may have missed. Um, so the live scribe pen connects what's being recorded <coughs> with what's being written at that time. So after the class, they can go back and tap on maybe a graph they drew and hear what the professor was saying at the time that that graph was being drawn. Um, audio note taker, um, I thought it would be cool to show you the interface. So we're going to do a quick laptop switch. Sorry. I got it. So this is the interface of Audio Note Taker. A lot of students like this option. Um, so you can record, and as you're recording, um, it's. Sorry, so we can't see it. Oh, button. sorry. So as it's recording, um, this obviously the class is being recorded, but if the professor stops talking or there's a break in the lecture, that information's not recorded. Um, so the student does not have to go back and listen to a bunch of white noise. Um, another great thing is that if the professor is providing PowerPoints ahead of time, the student can load those into the presentation um, and record alongside, alongside the slides. So if Sorry. So when the professor moves to the next slide, so can the recording. Another great thing is um, if the student is, you know, if one of the slides is just review, they can color code it to be summary. Um, but if the professor starts explaining something really important that's on the upcoming test, they can color code it as important. Um, there are a lot of cool features, but the last one that I wanted to show you is while they're recording the lecture here, um, they can type notes alongside what's being recorded. So we do encourage students to take their own notes, and the recording is to be a supplement to the notes that they're taking in class. Um, so I just wanted to show you guys this quick. Um, so then, I don't believe there's a speech to text feature here, no. Um, but playback is really easy. Doesn't have to go through and listen to a bunch of white noise. Maybe. <laughs> no, unless they type it. Um, do we want to finish on my laptop or put that one back in? Can we continue like this, or should I restart it? Um, you can restart it, and we'll click through. Okay. Um, while we're getting set up to where we were before, again, I just mentioned the LiveScribe pen. Um, th so I've been using the pen for quite a while, um, and I did a study with students at the Lab School of Washington, which is a school just down the street, 
Um, sorry if you've heard this story before. Um, but anyway, we, we've been using the, the pen as a tool for note taking for kids with language based learning disabilities, um, which is what we're referring to them right now. Um, but anyway, the, or, or dyslexic students. Whichever they want to be called. Um, but anyway, the, um, the pen records their notes while they're in class. And one of the things we, t we learned was that they actually could create much more organized and comprehensive notes. But the other thing that was really powerful for the high school students is they really felt like they could listen in class. Mm -hmm. They didn't feel like they were like, just using all their cognitive energy taking, um, taking notes. And if you want to know more about how the digital pen might work with students with learning disabilities, you can ask um, Christine Bresnahan, who's a doctoral student here in the Behavior, Cognition, and Neuroscience, and actually physically right here in the room <laughs> with us today. So um, that's uh, some of the work with the LiveScribe pen we're really excited about. Awesome. And one more note on that. Um, kind of the, the old school model was peer note takers, so giving students copies of notes from their peers. We found when we switched over to recording, um, I mean, students really like it, but also it just gives them a lot more autonomy. Um, and, you know, as much as we would encourage students with peer note takers to still be engaged during class, I think it's harder to do that when you know I'm going to be getting the notes from someone else versus when you know I'm using audio note taker, I'm using the LiveScribe pen, um, so I need to be fully engaged during class. So next accommodation we'll talk about is extended deadlines. Um, can you click? Oh, sorry. Thank you. And this accommodation, um, if you have seen it, it's pretty wordy and pretty nuanced. So we're going to go through the actual text of it piece by piece <laughs> at some point. Cool. OK. So first part, extended deadlines on assignments when existing deadlines are not integral to the goal of the course. So again, this is. <laughs> You're fine. Don't worry. <laughs> um, again, this is the actual text of the accommodation. Um, so when existing deadlines are not integral to the goal of the course. So this kind of harkens back to that part about not creating a fundamental alteration. Let's say a student is in a journalism class, um, and part of the class is being able to meet a really tight deadline, because that's often what you need to do as a journalist. It could be a situation in which this accommodation is not appropriate. And second part, student has responsibility for communicating in a timely fashion with the professor regarding the status or concerns about meeting assignment deadlines in order for reasonable adjustments to be determined. So this is assuming that students in the class have a syllabus or a schedule for the class and they know about all deadlines for the whole semester. Um, so like all students, we would assume that students with this accommodation are looking forward to future deadlines and that they should be able to give you more notice than just day of that they might need an extension. This could be um, different if it's a, an assignment with a really short turnaround time, but in general, if the student knows the deadline in advance, they should be doing that planning. Like all accommodations, um, flexible deadlines is not retroactive. So we always tell students, once you get that letter with this accommodation, make sure you get it to your professors as soon as you can, because it's not active until your professors know about it. And finally, in considering future requests for extended deadlines as an accommodation, the reasonableness of allowing those extensions may be considered in conjunction with the planned progression of the course. This could be especially relevant for assignments that really build off of one another. Um, for example, we have some classes where the major project of the semester might be a research paper, and that research paper is um, completed over time in segments. So let's say the first assignment is a proposal for the paper, um, and the next assignment is to do an annotated bibliography kind of based on that proposal and feedback received from it. If a student with this accommodation request to extend the deadline for the proposal until after the annotated bibliography is due, it could be problematic because the idea is that one assignment leads to another. So that is that one. Um, and one that is kind of similarly complicated and tricky, flexible attendance. Um, first part of the language for this one is opportunity to meet with professor to discuss attendance and class participation requirements that may be impacted as a result of the student's disability. So as you can see, very much not a free pass for students not to go to class. It really is just, just providing an opening for the student to have that conversation. Um, and it's also kind of us, the ASAC, communicating to faculty. We have really good reason to know that this student will need some flexibility with attendance. 
Um, again, not retroactive, um, and that kind of goes along with the last point, which is in considering future absences as an accommodation, the reasonableness of allowing those absences may be considered in conjunction with, plan with past absences. Um, so if a student isn't approved for this accommodation until partway through the semester, and they've already missed a lot of classes, it would be fair to really limit the number of classes the student can miss for the rest of the semester if they have already missed a great deal. Um, and if you've seen this accommodation, you know that there also is a separate supplemental document that goes into even more detail about the guidelines. So we wanted to go through um, the process in our office for determining these two accommodations, attendance and the deadline accommodation, um, because it is slightly different than our general process. So we start by gathering the student's self-report and documentation, that's standard. The next piece, though, is we present the student's request at our weekly documentation review meeting. Um, this part is a little different. Generally, for accommodations, we approve them more or less autonomously. Um, but for these ones, we do decide them by committee. And that's because they're higher level accommodations and because we know that being in class and meeting deadlines are really vital parts of the college experience. So if we're approving these, we want to make sure that we're being very thorough in our decision and that we're being consistent about it. Um, after that point, usually a week or so later, um, the student is contacted with a decision about whether it is being approved or not. And if it is, we invite the student in for another appointment to go over those guidelines. Um, and during that meeting, we really emphasize the importance of the student meeting with each professor individually, because um, these are really not one size fits all accommodations. And from there, if it is approved, um, that is when the student and professor then work together on those arrangements. And ASAC is happy to help, but it often is um, kind of a, a conversation between the student and professor primarily. Um, so it rolls and expectations for that part of the process. Again, student's responsibility to get the letter to the professor's ASAP. Um, we would ask that you as the professor read over those guidelines, even though they are, they are a little lengthy. Um, the student should also schedule an in-person meeting, if possible, or over, over the phone or Skype um, with each professor to make specific arrangements, and we would ask faculty to respond to that request in a timely manner. And during that meeting, um, the student kind of serves, serves as the expert on their disability. That's not to say a student with, say, migraines is the expert on all migraines, but they're the expert on their specific experience with migraines. So they can go into that conversation kind of knowing how their migraines affect them um, and realistically, let's say, how many classes they think they'll need to miss that semester. Um, whereas the professor is the expert on the course learning outcomes and essential requirements. So if the student says, realistically, I'll probably need to miss five classes, the professor can kind of make the call about whether or not the student can miss that many classes and still be able to get the essential learning outcomes. Um, and if not, we might need to get creative and that's where the ASAC can sometimes help. Um, so both student and professor should collaborate on a written agreement with what is discussed in that meeting. We do find it saves a lot of problems and confusion and headaches later on if that agreement is in writing um, and there's a clear understanding for both parties. And next, we would love to hear a little bit more from our faculty. Um, just any of their thoughts, experiences, accommodations, anything like that that you think of? So, um, hi, this is Tanya Aho again. Um, one of the things I was thinking about sharing um, is maybe a sort of step-by-step -step discussion of what I do when a student discloses their accommodations and wants to discuss them because I guess there are sometimes questions around faculty are sometimes wondering, you know, what is the best way to respond to this? Um, and maybe you all want to have a conversation about that, so I'll just give you my version and we can talk about it um, also in the Q&A. Um, so one of the things that I always do when a student um, discloses that they get accommodations is um, I like, you know, very consciously take that moment to um, acknowledge that this is a very vulnerable thing that they have to do, um, and it's a very hard thing that they have to do. And leading up to that moment, they've already put in a lot of work when they're probably in a place where it's really hard to do anything. I mean, it depends on um, what their accommodations are, what their disability is. I have a lot of students with um, psychological disabilities and a lot of students in like acute mental health crisis. And so I know for them, it is really difficult to already go through the process and, and even get a diagnosis. And um, t so at that point where they're coming to me, um, they've already done a lot of work. So I just basically tell them, you know, I say, thank you. Um, for sharing this with me. I know that can be really hard. 
I sort of acknowledge the feelings that are in the room, right? Um, that this can be difficult. Um, it's not just okay to say those things. I think for students, oftentimes, it's really helpful to see that somebody actually understands, even when they don't have that lived experience, that this might be a difficult moment for them. Um, you know, kind of read their body language and, and see how they're inhabiting your space. Maybe they're in your office hours and they're like standing up and they're sort of almost about to run outside of the room or maybe they're sitting down, but they're, you know, maybe they don't like making eye contact, but maybe they're also just, they seem very despondent, whatever it is, try and, try and really see them as the, that person coming to you in that moment and being very vulnerable. Um, so I acknowledge that, I thank them for it, and then I ask them, you know, how can I help you? Um, it's a very open-ended question. Oftentimes they will say, well, I'm supposed to talk to you about this letter and, you know, go through the individual accommodations. And, and I say, obviously we can do that, you know. Um, what else can we do, right? Um, and sometimes, and this depends absolutely on you all, um, oftentimes it helps a student to know that they're not the only one with the experience. So either I say things like, either I self-disclose about my own disabilities or I say something like, you know, we have a lot of students here at AU with similar experiences. Um, and so um, I've had a number of these conversations. You know, there's a number of things we can do to help you still do really well in this class. I believe you can do well in this class. It's oftentimes very helpful, too, for them to hear that, you know, um, you don't see their accommodations as something that makes them less of a student or less likely to do well, um, that you still believe in them, um, and that you know, you're know you there to figure out that process with them. And, and oftentimes, what has surprised me is that um, a lot of the students will not actually use all of their individual accommodations, like everything that their letter states. Oftentimes, students will say, oh, I don't really need um, the flexible attendance, or I don't need the um, extended testing, or you know, they, they maybe in that moment just need a couple of those. And I make sure to say, well, you know, this is for the whole semester, so let's check in again, maybe closer to the final exam. Um, to make sure that also their feeling and experience of that disabling condition can change over time, right? And it can, it can, and obviously they can go back to ASAC and then and then readjust. And I've had students who in the beginning came with a relatively um, short list of accommodations, and maybe now halfway through the semester they do need the flex attendance or um, some of those other higher level accommodations. Um, and so just always actively communicating to the student that you're aware of the process, that you understand things can change, um, that you're willing to work out alternatives. Um, and this, in the sort of UDL perspective, helps me too with students who might not have gone to ASAC to get accommodations, but who uh, disclose their disabilities nonetheless. So I have a lot of students, for example, who have extreme anxiety, um, or for example, who have um, depression and um, have not gotten official accommodations yet, right? And so for one of my classes, um, we have so-called discussion Fridays. And for the students with really intense in-classroom anxiety, um, that's a very difficult place to inhabit. And so one of the students has put in so much work, um, and, and she's actually said that she's also um, had conversations with people at ASAC, but she doesn't have like an official letter. Um, but how to deal with that and how to still do well and how can she still show that she is learning and thinking along and doing these things, um, but she can't lead discussion because it's just, it's impossible for her to do that. Um, and so we've come up with a number of different, I have asked her, you know, um, well, why don't you think about what you could do instead instead of just giving her a list of options? Um, and then I've said, let's meet and talk them through. Um, and this is a process we've been working on over a couple of weeks and she's come up with a number of different things um, that she could do instead. And, and I have found students at a you or actually they will, when you ask them, for example, well, how many sessions do you think you'll miss, right, because of your migraines? Um, oftentimes faculty assume students will try and get the maximum amount of, but that's actually not true. My students tend to lowball what they will actually need. Um, and so oftentimes when they will say, okay, I think I will miss about three sessions, I'll say, well, why don't we go with like five um, and see if that works out. Um, and Oftentimes that's actually closer to the reality of what ends up happening anyway. Um, but the students that I have encountered are not <coughs> using these accommodations to, to have an easier time to not put in as much work. Actually, they're oftentimes some of the hardest working students that I have. And, and it's because when you look at the recording software, for example, you have to put in so much extra effort, right? Um, it in some ways makes it easier to process information, um, but it 
certainly asks for extra energy and time. And um, so those are some of the things that I, I try to acknowledge and discuss with the students and let them know that I have an understanding um, of what their side looks like. I was having a, a think about what would be the best thing to discuss right now. I've been uh, teaching here for 20 years now and I've probably had accommodated students in every class for that um, for that period. So one of the things I thought about would be to make sure that you uh, are flexible because the sorts of accommodations you make in one class um, might not be the sort of thing you might want to immediately go to in another class. For example, I, um, teaching a large 150 student uh, gen ed class is different to your 13 student um, <coughs> majors class where you may have a single student with accommodations, for example, in that 150 class that I've been teaching for probably 15 years now, um, there's probably at least 10 students with vari variable accommodations in there. Um, and what you need to do for them in a large classroom setting, mostly lecture format, difficult to do discussions, difficult to do other types of, of learning in, um, is different to what you can do in a, for a student in a smaller classroom who's a major, who uh, where you're doing more discussion based and you're spending uh, doing uh, different types of um, uh, pedagogical activities. And so I guess the, the, the thing would be to make sure that you keep uh, that sort of flexibility in mind when you're dealing um, uh, with those different students and of course the different types of assessment that, that you have for those, um, for those different settings. And so for example, uh, for a lot of my uh, large gen ed classes, I um, uh, do my assessment through Blackboard and a lot of it's online and a lot of it's done outside of class time which can be um, stressful for students if they're not in the classroom and don't have access to the professor for questioning and things like that. So it sets up a different dynamic um, in that regard and so um, you know the, thing, the things you have to do under one classroom setting will be very different to what you need to set up under, under a different setting. And so uh, be, be flexible, don't get stuck in a rut and bring, well, this is what I did in that class, so I'm gonna do it here. Um, keep, keep in mind um, that the different students are gonna have different requirements depending on the, the classroom um, setting. Um, and I had one story I just wanted to tell. In, in 20 years, I've had uh, two uh, students who were, um, who were in wheelchairs. And of course, uh, I'm a biologist and we're in Hearst. And Hearst is not necessarily very easily wheelchair accessible. And they have labs in that, in that building, and those labs take two and a half hours. And so we were able to get students in there because there's a clunky lift that we can get students up into the building in. Once they're in their lab, they're stuck on that floor. They can't access the bathroom. To go to the bathroom, they have to go next door to Kerwin. So if, <laughs> if in a two and a half hour lab you need to leave, then um, it can take uh, 30 minutes to get yourself back into the lab setting. Um, and so it was very challenging and in both of those times in those two years the students have said to me well it looks like you can't be a biology major if you're in a wheelchair and in, in under that setting it was absolutely true in many respects um, so that's uh, that's just something I, I want to share with you it hasn't come up very often and it's been 20 years and we still have the same problem uh, on campus here with that so um, uh, solving that problem with the new hall of science being built I hope um, so um, that's all I wanted to share, and I'm happy to handle other questions if people um, have uh, specific things later. Yeah, and the, the I would like to also yield my time to hear your questions. I mean, my experience of 25 years teaching here um, is that our faculty are creative and interesting, and I have a feeling that you're here and we're preaching to a choir in a way. Um, so there might be ways or ideas that you could share with us that we could also take back to colleagues who aren't as um, interested or just don't have the tools available to them right now to make the types of accommodations that our students um, might need. So I will, unless you want me to blather on about something, maybe I won't. Question um, sounds good. Questions. <laughs> Should we get the, we yeah, have a mic So I have a couple of questions around the identity uh, piece of disability um, for whoever would like to respond. Um, you were talking, Tanya, about um, the language use and how it can depend on the individual, right? I had never 
heard that I had always heard you know put the person first that that view and so that's very helpful um, I'm wondering in materials when we have to write things down, right? Which so I'm not so much in the classroom, uh, but we have a lot of materials on our website and handouts and et cetera, et cetera. What's your advice on how to handle that, right? So that's one. And then the second piece is on the identity-based piece. Have you all dealt at all with intersectionality issues and how do you think through that and help with that? Um, so hi, this is Tanya again. So the written language, a funny anecdote, if that would be helpful. Um, I mentioned the symposium that we're organizing for April 10th. And in the call, uh, we used both person first and identity first language. Um, and I got a lot of responses from people who were confused about my usage of identity first language. Um, that evoked a number of feelings, let's say, in people. Um, because I think, for the most part, following legal and policy um, language use that is all, currently is always um, person-first language, right? So most official documents you will see, including everything we have here, um, is the sort of person <laughs> with a disability, right? Um, which is why I'm saying using identity-first language um, is a conscious choice to go against an established standard. It might be helpful to think about it in the sense in which we have changed our language use about um, other forms of identity, right? So um, if you think of the history of how we've talked about race, right? Um, we've moved in some contexts from saying African American to black or black American. Um, if you think about sexuality, we have, and gender identity, we have changed a lot the ways in which we talk about um, those identifications. So language is always flexible and changing. Um, but you obviously have to consider the context in which you're using that written language. I used in the call, I used both person first and identity first language um, in an attempt to signal that I'm aware that both forms are in use and that I respect both ways of identifying and self-identifying. Um, but that didn't necessarily come across to some people, right? And they thought I was so misinformed and just didn't realize that it is really insulting to use identity first language. Um, and so, and I did not expect that kind of reaction, but I think it's because in some ways at educational institutions and, um, and other institutions were so entrenched in this one particular way where, you know, we're, we're sort of at a point where we're like, yes, we learn how to talk about disability without it being stigmatizing. We don't say um, handicapped anymore and we learn not to say like wheelchair bound. So now we have this language and, and, and that was fought for, right? Um, and it was really hard to get that change. And so um, being at a moment where, you know, a lot of disabled folks are saying, well, but we really would prefer if you said, like, I would prefer if you said that I'm autistic, right? And not I'm in a person with autism. And I'm also not a person with gayness. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a person with queerness, right? Um, and so, but that can be difficult. And so that's why I say I don't think there's one right or wrong way of saying it. Um, it's just to keep that in mind, to think about yourself and your own position and how you identify. And am I writing about other people? Am I writing about my own people? Um, am I writing about myself? And then what kind of position of power do I have? Who is receiving this, right? It's, so I don't have a great, correct, easy answer. Um, but it is to certainly, my answer is always to read more about it, um, to read what people have to say or listen to what people have to say who actually have that identity if you don't have it yourself. Um, and, you know, I normally default to that, whatever the other person or that group of people. But there's also not, it's not like all autistic people prefer one way of talking about their autism, right? So, um, so it's difficult. Um, I can also talk about intersectionality, but if, if anybody else would like to. Go for it. I can touch on it. Okay, so I'll start and yeah. then, okay. Um, and that's certainly something that, you know, I think about a lot, um, both in my research and in my teaching. Um, and so, you know, some of the ways in which disability intersects with, especially race, um, but also with um, 
sexual orientation, with gender identity, um, with legal status, with employment status, um, with military status, right? Um, the number of veterans with PTSD that we have, um, with parental status, all of those things, um, I think are really crucial questions to consider. And so, um, especially if we have students who are multiply marginalized, um, I think it becomes especially difficult and important in those moments to realize um, sometimes for a student it might be more important to uh, um, focus not on their disability identity but to focus on um, some other aspect that is more important maybe also within the educational context is more important to them. I also think that in an institution of of higher education, it is so difficult oftentimes for our students and ourselves um, to think about disability as something to be proud of because in some ways, um, whereas some other identity categories might be easier um, because they're not as connected to what people perceive as your work performance or your learning performance, right? Um, and so being a professor and being queer these days, you know, go together very easily. Um, being a professor and being dyslexic, um, maybe if you're in the humanities, um, might not, right? And so I think for our students too, this is a really important question to keep in mind. Um, but then also to keep in mind how, because of everything else going on in their lives, the ways in which they identify, um, and especially where they have come from, right? And how hard they might've fought to get here or worked to get here. Um, and how that has been influenced by, by their race and, again, by their legal status and, um, and all of those other uh, ways of identifying. So um, that's my beginning, and now I'll throw it to you. Um, I was just, um, sorry, we'll get to your question. Um, so something I think about a lot is how people with disabilities were often left out of major movements. Um, in history, so I was doing some reading and um, someone made a point that, you know, individual with disabilities didn't get to go to, you know, gay rights meetings because they were often in church basements or underground bars that they couldn't get to. Um, so that really struck me. And of course, I'm always thinking about accessibility, but thinking about student groups here and where they choose to meet and where um, they hold events and, you know, just a few years ago, a sorority was holding in a formal at an inaccessible event venue um, and what that did for the students in the sorority with disabilities and they were invisible disabilities. So then they had to kind of disclose and then the venue had to change and it was this whole process. And then the student with the disability feels like a burden. Um, so remembering all of that when maybe you're planning study sessions or your office hours, if you are in Hearst, can you meet in Starbucks um, or somewhere else across campus that may be easier for students to get to. Um, I Also, for me, it's important to remember that students with disabilities are students, you know, they're gonna go to parties, they're going to skip class, um, they're gonna do anything of regular, regular, see that's bad language. <laughs> um, they're gonna do anything a student without a disability will do. So just remembering that as well. They're not in this bubble of them. So I wanna speak to, um, I think your name, Anna. Anna, you mentioned um, extended deadlines and you said that in a class where deadlines are important that maybe it's not, you know, maybe it's not uh, doable. But in teaching journalism classes where deadlines are essential and key to the class and having students who have submitted disability requests for extended time. I mean, what suggestions do you have for us to, because I definitely want to make sure that we're adhering to the rules and also respecting students um, disclosing to us, but still making sure that we're training them so that they'll be able to compete when they get out into the career world. Sure, it's a great question. Um, so the, the first thing to think about is what are the learning outcomes for the class and can a student truly not meet those learning outcomes if they are having extensions? Um, and I would say you know, it's a pretty high bar to say that a student is by following an accommodation not meeting the learning outcomes. So that's our starting point. Um, I think that the second place we would go is 
maybe like a lot of flexibility isn't possible, but is a little bit of flexibility possible? Is it possible on, say, a choice one or two assignments to have a little bit of wiggle room? Um, because our students, especially with these accommodations, they're pretty good at being strategic and thinking, okay, I know for this class, I'm going to have limited flexibility. For this one, I have a little bit more, so I can maybe turn this assignment in late for this class and know that I really need to get this one in. Um, occasionally, it's a situation where it's just not going to work. And obviously, we hope it's within the ad drop deadline if a student knows that this class is just not compatible with extended deadlines and they might need to go into a different class. I would say that doesn't happen often. We do like to put that out there because even with accommodations, we can't clear all barriers. Um, so I'd say first, think about the essential learning outcomes um, and how they can be met and maybe how they can be met in alternate ways. Um, so is there something different a student can do to be able to get at that same learning outcome, even if it looks a little different than other students? But it's definitely a tough question. Um, and it's one that we would invite you to call ASAC and talk with us about it. Um, and we're happy to help in specific situations. for the recording um, okay thank you so for those students who are on incompletes or requesting extensions for incomplete assignments do their uh, accommodations carry over up until that point or do they end at the end of the semester they would still be relevant. Are you thinking of any specific accommodations that might be like difficult to implement after the semester is officially ended? I just want to know what the policy is so we can better work with the students if we do come across that situation. Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, yep, they would still be relevant, especially like if it's testing accommodations, we are open in the summer um, and still able to administer tests. Um, obviously, with something like extended deadlines, they still need to meet that agreed upon deadline for the incomplete. Um, but other than that, I don't think of any that wouldn't be relevant in that sort of situation. And we are still all open in the summer. So we're here for that sort of support. And then a second question. Um, when I read admissions essays, uh, quite frequently, prospective students disclose mm -hmm. their you know, whatever um, uh, circumstances. And at that point, you know, my gut reaction, oh, I want to help the student to succeed. Can I, should I be proactive and reach out to ASAC and tell them that, you know, these students might be coming in. But it seems to me that this is a student driven request and that administration should kind of stay away until the student reaches out. So how would you suggest we handle besides letting students know about ASEC, about, you know, the process at orientation, etc. Is there a good way to for us to work with the students and with you, especially the, the new incoming and I work with graduate students. So So students, if they're graduate students, hopefully they went through the process as an undergrad somewhere. Um, but specifically, you know, we are at orientation. We attend graduate orientations. We attend preview day. Um, we attend open houses for students. Like we're around. They, not to say we're capturing everyone there, but we're capturing a majority. Um, then, you know, professors will make referrals to our office or suggest that students meet with us. Um, and that's another way we capture some students. Um, in your role, I would say it's okay to mention um, or pass along the resources, but, you know, not much more than that, not like necessarily facilitating a conversation because we really do want the student to the student has to self-identify the student um, needs to come to us and kind of know the process so a connection to the office would be fine but um, in terms of like coming to a meeting with a student would not be appropriate um, does that answer your question more or less yeah yeah we are always welcome to referrals, yeah. but we just have to kind of, you know, draw the line somewhere. And I think I'll add the kind of nice thing about us having the structure that we do where we do the disability support, but also the general academic support is you can always just refer students to ASAC, um, you know, without saying, I think you have a disability or because you need accommodations. It's a good way to do it. And then once they get to our office, we can route them in the right direction. Um, but it can be helpful for referrals in that way.
It just as a personal note, I think that I run a graduate program as well, and I just try to make sure it's in our handbook and on all the syllabi, just so that students get lots of opportunities to to note that it's there and available. So I'm sure you've got it in those places too, but sort of like not skipping over that. And <laughs> I think that those are just reminders. It is very much a student-driven program. Um, and, and often students think that they can, especially graduate students think that they don't need those accommodations until they get into midterms. And so just reminding them that, you know, it's on our syllabus, reminding faculty to point it out as well. Yeah, and I think I would um, add to that, this is Tanya again, that, um, for sometimes for students, they might be coming from families or cultures um, where certain disabilities are highly stigmatized. And so they might not always, so one of the things I struggle with is not exactly what you described because you said they self-disclose, but sometimes I see students who are clearly in distress um, or are struggling in the class um, because of certain comprehension issues, um, reading skills or, or listening skills or whatever it is, um, how they process information, but they are not aware of the fact or they have never been encouraged to seek out help. And so what I really love about um, ASAC is that you can you don't have to make it about the disability. You can say, hey, look, we have this great office um, and they can help you figure out better reading strategies or um, you know, a lot of folks go there when they're struggling to meet deadlines. Um, and so it's a way of not forcing a sort of diagnosis or identification onto the student um, while still sort of maybe getting them into the pipeline to go talk to ASAC um, and then get a lot more support that can, can help them do well. So faculty frequently look for reassurance that their approach to working with a student and making the accommodation resembles the approaches that other faculty have taken. What resources, simply because, especially if you are adjunct or term or pre-tenure, there's a vulnerability around any move that is unlike your general approach to teaching your course. What resources do we provide to our faculty to connect them with um, other approaches people have taken? Do we uh, accumulate information over time about a student, about what accommodations have worked well or didn't work well for students? Uh, just interested in hearing a little bit about what do we do to support faculty who are working with students? Go ahead. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to um, We don't have a ton of faculty to faculty resources at this time. I think it's a good idea. I think we rely mostly on faculty reaching out to us when they get the accommodations letter and they see the name on it if they have questions. Um, but I think, you know, something like this, we're hoping to be a starting point to have more of these conversations. But I think it, it does tend to be, at least from what we know, a little bit more a conversation between our office and faculty rather than between faculty. But that's a great idea to do more of that. I think we have a thought. I do. Uh I'm thinking in terms of what Tanya was sharing about how she opens that conversation with students. Oftentimes, if you include a question such as what has worked for you in the past, they can self-advocate uh, some really useful ideas. I might also just chime in here. I know that um, part of my role as a faculty mentor, which I've been doing for term faculty for many years now, is that's always part of my conversation with new faculty. I said, don't, don't forget, you've got this fabulous office, and don't forget if you think you've got students who uh, are having challenges that you, you can direct them uh, to this and be aware that you may have students in your classrooms who are gonna need uh, uh, this sort of assistance and just, just to prime them uh, with it. And it's something I always have in, in the conversations I have with uh, faculty, especially new, new faculty who are onboarding. But I know that they don't really get it formally in any um, orientation or except for the exposure to the the office itself there's no formal um, yeah this is what you sh should do this is this is what you could do under these circumstances etc but it's always um, always conversations I've had uh, mentoring faculty it's it's a constant topic I wanted to ask um, uh, if you could put a finer point on what is reasonable and how you have accommodated deadline extensions, especially when it comes to longer, say, papers, etc. The time and a half seems, you know, something that applies more to tests. What about, you know, you have a 48-hour turnaround or you have a week to finish or it has to be done within this week? 
what does that really mean and how flexible can faculty be? How flexible have you been uh, in those cases? Yeah, we should, that's a good point. We should definitely clarify something like um, time and a half or double time on tests does only apply to in-class sit-down tests. Um, occasionally faculty and sometimes students are confused about that. Um, but if it if it isn't a, a combination around more time on an outside of class assignment, that would be the extended deadline accommodation, not the extended time on test. Um, in terms of determining what's reasonable, I think we would start with the student to say, you know, based on your disability, um, both in general and what's going on with you right now specifically, um, how much more time do you think you would need? I think that's a good place to start. Um, and I think for the faculty member, it's to think about, okay, they're asking for five more days. If they had five more days, um, would that create a problem with an essential learning outcome in the class? Or would it interfere with another assignment? Um, or do they really need to have that done before five days? Because what we're doing in class in two days assumes that they have that done. So it's it's kind of trying not to be arbitrary about it. I think there can be a reaction of like five days, that seems like a lot of time. Um, but really thinking about, is, th is this truly an issue? Or will it not actually make that much of a difference in terms of the learning outcomes of the class if they have five more days? Do you guys have experience with that? Yeah, I was just going to um, add a little bit to that. I also remind them that um, they have five other classes mm -hmm. and there is other stuff due there and they should be very cognizant of what's coming up next and they need to make sure that they don't start pushing all that other stuff further and further on. So I, I say to them, you know, my conversation is usually like, well, how much time do you have? And when is when is the next thing that's due in, cl in this class? What about your other classes? What are you doing now? Are you, are you writing assignments currently? What time do you have? And therefore, let's talk about what could be added to that. I, th I think the only thing else I would add to that question is just thinking about scaffolding assignments, if I can use that term. Like, you know, if, if, if there's a major project due or even a small project due, and it seems like it's got a big deadline, maybe the students got it in their head that they have to do it kind of within two days of that deadline. And so maybe sitting down with them and looking at the syllabus and saying, well, you know, this week nothing else is due. Do you want to send me a draft of this first part? Um, so I, th I think that's just one other way to think about, you know, kind of students' anticipation of helping them get organized, like Chris was saying, like thinking about what else they have going on when they can send potentially a part of a project so that you can help them, frankly, get started on the project bef well before the deadline. So that's just a, you know, I I'm sure you know that already, but just sort of a practical sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, the only other thing I just wanted to go back to Gil Ilham's question because I was just so struck by it. And, and, and when Tanya actually used a disability first statement, I was also like, wait, no, we're not allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. But then it, it, remind, it reminded me much of what Erica was saying about a lot of the disability rights work and, and thinking about this whole statement, nothing about us without us. And I think we've done a lot in, in my field in special education about individuals with disabilities without asking them what they wanted. And I think, to, to me, again, I, that was really powerful for me to think about that idea of the civil rights of a person who has a lot of life experiences and we and they tend to hide their disability last, you mm -hmm. know, the, the intersexuality and all those sort of things that we're dealing with. So thank you for that question. I, I first encountered it actually recently when one of our Marshall Scholar um, finalists who was going to interview for this um, was really advocating in this way and was and used that phrase which I hadn't heard before you know uh, nothing about us without us yeah. right yeah um, and was very struck both by the students you know self-advocacy and kind of the whole idea of identity so it was it's very helpful uh, so can I just follow up on the extended deadline piece and ask another right. clarification? Uh, always popular, I see. Yes. <laughs> um, so I end up teaching um, in the summer a lot or on other non sort of 15 week schedules. Mm -hmm. um, and so particularly because of uh, sort of scaffolded assignments and, and you know, we figure out what that accommodation looks like as we move through the semester. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're halfway into that all of a sudden and we're at week three or week four, that, that's a big chunk of the class. Um, and, and a lot of times the solution has been because of accommodations to talk in terms of incompletes and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and from you know prior experience with students, I know that sometimes having an incomplete on a transcript has implications for other things at the university when it comes to you know funding and things like that. Does the accommodation come with 
any additional understanding of, of sort of what an incomplete on a, on a transcript, you know, particularly if we're in a summer that goes into an incomplete that comes into the fall. And if we're looking at funding being dispersed as the academic year starts or something like that, um, from, from the ASAC perspective, is there any additional sort of understanding of what an incomplete means for a student with accommodations? Not really. I mean, to be honest, when we talk to students about incompletes, um, we usually tell them that it's not a big deal and that it, you know, it's going to be changed. It doesn't matter that much. So that's good for us to think about ways in which it probably could. Um, I would say more in terms of the summer classes, that is something that we often talk with students about. Um, the fact that these accommodations, attendance and deadlines, um, in a condensed summer course, sometimes it's just not as feasible because it is, it's a short amount of time to get all the material in. Um, so potentially there could be a little bit of wiggle room, but maybe whereas during the semester you could expect a couple days extra, you could probably only expect one or something like that. Um, but yeah, the incomplete part is interesting. I would say, you know, obviously there are times when students just, they do need to take summer classes, um, but we also talk with them about because of their impact, their disabilities, and because of these accommodations, sometimes summer classes aren't the best way to go. So if they have a choice of not doing it, it can be better not to. So I'm gonna jump in with that. I wanna thank the, uh, the panelists for joining us this afternoon and sharing their wisdom and knowledge with us. So thank you very much. <laughs> and before um, we just disperse one quick note, all of the resources that are in front of you on the table will also be uploaded to the events page so that if you want to go back to them, as well as the uh, contact information are on the Noontime Conversation webpage. So thank you again, and we'll see you um, next time. <laughs>